and we're live. Okay. Hi, everyone. Sorry, we are a couple of minutes late. Uh, we're just wrapping our uh, board meeting and trying to get set up here uh, to bring another wonderful talk to you. Uh, so just introductions. Uh, my name is Sukhada. I run the guest speaker program at SJA. Um, since the COVID-19 pandemic, we have decided to take a few of our bunch of our events uh, virtual um, so we can reach all of astronomy enthusiasts out there in a safer way. So this is one part of that effort. Uh, this is the guest speaker program that runs every um, every month. We have our general meetings um, following the board meeting uh, around the full moon weekend. Uh, and then that's that's when we don't go out and do our, any, any observing. Um, so any questions you have, uh, please post them in the chat channel and we will address them at the end of the talk. Um, this is just to make things easier. Uh, so, but feel free to discuss among yourselves in the chat channel during the talk as well. But after the talk is done, uh, after Bob finishes, I will look at the chat channel and relay the questions to him and we can try to answer all your questions uh, you might have. So a little bit about SJA, we have been around for many years. Um, like I said, this is, this is a new thing we are trying. Uh, we, we have our annual membership and feel free to go to sj.net to find out more. Uh, most of our programs are open to public. You don't have to be a member. So if you want to just check us out, you, you, know, you are free to just go to the meetup website uh, and find us there. Uh, we have a group named SJ Astronomy that I'm currently running and you just have to uh, join the meetup membership there uh, using your meetup account and you, you will get notified about our upcoming events. Uh, one of the great events we recently did is a virtual star party, which was a huge hit. Uh, as it's become challenging to go out and look at stars in person, we tried to bring the stars to you and it was great. So this is like, th there are other events such as solar viewing and so on and so forth, which we are currently experimenting with. So any, any questions you may have about the club, uh, either you can, like I said, ask in the chat channel as well and, or reach out to us later on after the talk. So, Going to the talk for today, uh, we have a speaker who is, who's been our member. His name is Bob Garfingel. And it's interesting that he was actually scheduled to give a talk in March. And unfortunately we had to reschedule him because COVID-19 just suddenly shut everything down. Um, but I'm glad that we are able to reschedule him soon after and we like a couple of months and He's going to talk to us about his Lunar Observer's Handbook today, Luna Cognita. And I believe if we were actually meeting this in person for this, we could probably take a look at his book. Uh, but I believe Bob will tell us a lot about that. A little bit about Bob. He writes astronomy books, articles, and book reviews, and is recognized as an independent scholar on history of astronomy and observing the night sky. And I think he received his first BA history in, and a second BA in English literature from Cal State, Hayward. He's past president of California Writers Club and mayor of Union City. Bob is also membership chair of Niles SNA Silent Museum in Fremont. So I think Bob, you have accomplished in many fields and I'm really eager to hear from you. So I will start presenting the talk and um, just let me know when you want me to change the slides and you may start now. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, one, one thing I want to just correct is that I'm membership chair of the Niles SNA Silent Film Museum. You forgot the word film, which is important. And as you can <laughs> Sorry, see, I'm wearing the shirt, uh, which is the uh, famous moon, the missile hitting the moon from the 1902 movie which was the very first film made in 1902 um, in which there was a plot. Up until that time, movies were uh, just documentaries. And I will talk about this as part of my talk because my talk is on the fantasy flights to the moon. Uh, but first I, I'd like to dedicate 
this talk as I've done before to my good friend uh, who passed away in October, Mike Reynolds. Mike was, uh, when he was out here, he was the director of the Chabot, first just the Chabot Observatory. And then when we moved up higher in the hill, it became the Chabot Space and Science Center. And if you notice, there is a space shuttle modeled behind Mike's shoulder. Mike was a runner up to Christy McAuliffe and the teacher in space uh, program back during the Reagan years. Uh, Mike uh, actually uh, was declared in Florida before that uh, teacher of the year. So he was a mentor to all of us uh, here. And then when he went back to uh, Florida uh, to teach, Mike was also for the uh, Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. He was the transit uh, recorder and I was going back to Florida to see the transit of Mercury that was in November of last year. And I was gonna see Mike and get back together again. And unfortunately he passed away about two weeks before the transit. So, okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, we're getting over play. We're still getting the, uh, there it goes, okay. So my talk is Fly Me to the Moon and it's a presentation to the San Jose Astronomical Society uh, on Google Hangouts. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, in 2008, I was honored by having a uh, asteroid renamed, uh, was asteroid 2000 EY70, it's now 31862 Garfinkel. And although uh, it wasn't mentioned in the introduction. I'm also a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. And this is some of the things that I have received because of that. Uh, I'm also the historian for the lunar section of the uh, British Astronomical Association. And I'm the book review editor for the Alpo Journal. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is the cover of my book, uh, which is called Luna Cognita. It just came out in March of this year, finally. It's three volumes. It's roughly 1,800 pages altogether, uh, 1,120,000 1, words and 1,365 figures. It's available as a set for this, for this price. Uh, Amazon keeps jumping the price around, so I never know what it is from day to day. Uh, but you can get it also from springer.com and it's $89.99 the full set what I this is uh, an antique map that's in the book and then a more modern map overlaying that what I really like is they've taken the letter O in the word cognita and had it like it's coming out from behind the moon like an occultation which is when uh, the moon covers or any celestial body covers another celestial body and then the move the one object moves away it's like an eclipse, which is a different type of occultation. So I really like like that. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Okay, uh, I guess we have to wait for it to clear up. So we're still getting the overlay of the previous slide there. Nope, nope, go back. Huh, I don't know what, okay. Uh, well, we got two slides showing there. There we go. Okay, uh, we'll start uh, what we believe is probably the earliest uh, story about a trip to the moon, Fantasy Flight, written by Lucian of Samosota in the second century. And it's called in English, The True History. Yet he starts out the book, his first couple of sentences, don't believe a word I'm writing. <laughs> Everything is a lie. So. Uh, there may be an earlier book written about a trip to the moon, but it doesn't exist. <clears throat> Back in those days, people thought the moon was very close. In fact, uh, they thought if you just went to the far mountains to the north, you could reach up and touch the moon as it swung over the, uh, the horizon. So Lucian tells his readers uh, that after they sail out through the gates of Hercules, we now know that as the Straits of uh, Gibraltar now, uh, they first stop at an island and they find there's a river uh, running with wine and fish and bears. Uh, there are no women on the island. 
uh, the only females are actually trees. Now, Lucian, uh, his adventurers, there's 50 of them in the boat. Uh, he loses two of them on the island because they uh, decide to uh, get together with the women trees and they get stuck. Uh, so they finally, uh, they're able to leave the island and they get caught up in a vortex and wind up in the moon. Now on the moon, there's a war going on between the king of the sun and the king of the moon. Now the king of the moon is the mythological character Endemion. And they're fighting over colonizing the planet Venus. So Lucian and his people, they get on the side of Endemion and they win the war. Uh, so after they leave the moon, they land in the ocean and they get swallowed by a 200 mile long whale. Now they're in the whale for a while. They finally escape by setting a bonfire inside the whale, but they don't get home. So the story ends uh, really before they get back. And Lucian says that he'll finish it in the second book. Well, kind of the real joke is that he never writes the second book. So this is where our fantasy flights begin. So let's uh, go on to the next slide, please. Okay, I mentioned Endemion. Now, uh, let's see, I can't, I'm not moving the cursor. Okay, you are. Okay. Uh, Diana in this painting is also known as Selene, uh, and that name will pop up in several other things and I will point that out. But this was a painting done in 1726 by the French artist Michel Francois d'André Bardon. Uh, he lived from 1700 to 1783. And in this picture, now Diana or Selene, the goddess of the moon, but she was also the goddess of fertility, so that's why she's shown bare-breasted. And she's a goddess of the moon. And you see kind of the weird moon because we really don't see the moon with the cusps so close together. And Endemion was a shepherd and he is sleeping because Zeus put him in perpetual sleep. He got angry at, at Endemion. But also in the photograph, in the painting, you'll see down in the corner, there's a French horn, a hunting horn. And Endemion has his foot on his hunting dog and Cupid, or Eros, depending on which mythology you're following, is shooting an arrow into Endemion. Well, the poor guy, he fathers 50 daughters uh, with Diana. And like I said, poor guy, because he's asleep through the whole thing. Well, the 50 daughters apparently represents the 50 months between the Greek Olympiads. Now, if you're ever in San Francisco, this painting, is hanging in the palace of the Legion of Honor. And it is uh, 78 inches tall by 51 inches across. Okay, very, very beautiful painting. What the arch at the top is the top of the frame in this uh, photograph. Okay, next please. Okay, this is the crater in Demian, uh, photographed by a friend who uh, supplied a lot of photographs in the book. The crater is about 120 kilometers or 75 miles across. It's up in the, as you're looking at the moon would be in the upper right-hand corner, the Northeast is what we get. And it was named by uh, Michael Florent Van, Le Van Lengren, who's known as Langrenus, uh, in, in a first map in 1644, which is the first lunar map to actually have nomenclature on it that we still use. This is one of the three craters that Langrenus named that still are in the same place that he named them. All the other names either got discarded or <clears throat> they have been moved to other sites. Uh, so next slide, please. Okay, now let's get to some of the fantasy flights. In this one, you'll see that's Cyrano de Bergerac flying through the space and he has around his waist and on his shoulders little bottles of dew. So this is a book, La History Communique des Estats Empire de la Lune. In other words, the, and published in 1656, called The Comic History of the States and Empires of the Moon. And he lived from approximately 1620 to 55. He also had a real crazy idea in which uh, he would throw a big magnet up into the sky and he was in a metal car, what they call a car, which we would now call a coach or a spacecraft. And that would pull him up. 
And then he would grab the magnet and throw it higher and higher. And each time it would attract the car up into this into the moon. Uh, now, in those days, they thought that the Earth and the moon were connected with the ether. So there was not going to be any problem you know, with uh, the vacuum of space because they didn't know it was a vacuum. They thought this ether connected the two bodies and all the stars and everything was all connected by this web of, of ether. So none of those things would work per se as far as uh, the bottles would do. That was his first attempt. The second was the magnet. Okay, next. Okay, this is an Italian travel book. Uh, and this is the front of piece picture of Antonio Caputi's uh, iambic, iambic pentameter trip to the moon uh, called the ecstasy and rapture over the moon by Archero Philoseleno. Now you notice the word Seleni in the name. Um, in this case, he rides up to the moon in a cloud and converses with the lunar inhabitants. Now WorldCat lists only nine known copies of this book and I have one of them. Okay, next. Next slide, okay. Now in this, book. This is not really a trip to the moon per se, but it was a, a play on Descartes' uh, book on four Texas. They thought that the rain on the earth came from actually from moisture from the moon in which the moon was heated by solar rays and then the water would drip out. So this was a, a sketch showing that. So it's from the 1753 book, Philosophical Dream Around the Causes of the Rain. Now there's an imaginary journey on a flying ship to the moon where the author discusses the physical phenomena, in other words, the heat of the sun, on lunar vapors that cause earthly rain. Now this book was inspired by the Voyage de la Monde by, by Descartes in 1690, uh, written by the Jesuit historian Gabriel Daniel in 1649 to 1728. Uh, his book was an ingenious satire on Descartes' system of vortexes put into the form of a cosmic voyage through the Cartesian universe. Okay, next slide. Now, this in this case, this is a uh, Reverend John Campbell's book called The Journey to the Moon, and he was, he was an English writer, uh, and interesting conversations with the inhabitants respecting the condition of the moon, uh, condition of man, I'm sorry, in 1811 by the Reverend John Campbell, who lived from 1776 to 1840. He's transported up to the moon with his telescope. He has a little table telescope, which was popular in those days. And when he's talking to the inhabitants, he wants to know, they want to know if people on earth know about God. Remember, he's a reverend. Well, I did need to uh, mention one thing is that in 1630, uh, Johannes Kepler, after he, she, shortly after he had died, a book was published uh, called the, uh, the Lunar Dream, in which he discusses that we could go up to the moon and meet with uh, the inhabitants there. And uh, this kind of sets the tone for some of the books that followed about in lunar inhabitants. Uh, so we see a lot of books starting in the after uh, Kepler. So can we go on to the next slide, please? Sure thing. Uh, we're still get. oh, okay. Uh, so during the 1600s and 1700s, there were additional fantasy flights to the moon, uh, using such things as birds, flying horses, and mysteriously powered flying machines. In many cases, the uh, author of these stories uh, barely tells you exactly, you know, what power is that they're using, especially with the mysterious powered flying machines. Uh, one lunar explorer uh, searches for friends lost wits. Now, one of the things that um, Kepler talked about was that when you die, your soul goes to the moon before it goes on higher to heaven. So here's this friend looking for things that are lost, this lost wit. He finds the jar and he brings them back to earth. And again, the author doesn't tell you how he got to the moon or how he got back. So, but in the early 1800s, 
Lord John Russell wrote a travel book called The Moon. And he wrote it anonymously, but we have uh, researchers discovered his, his handwriting and a copy of the book in the possession of a lady friend of his. Uh, and they compared the handwriting to the letter and a handwriting in the uh, dedication to this woman. And they have shown that the book is by Lord John Russell. Now he go, travels up to the moon again. We don't know how he got there. And he finds warehouses all over the place. And these warehouses are filled with everything that you lose on earth. Uh, might even be the socks under your bed, I guess. Uh, but it includes speeches, wife's nagging statements, memories, again, lost wits, uh, anything and everything. And again, he doesn't tell you how they get back home. Okay, next slide. Okay, let it clear up. Okay, now the Mongolfier brothers uh, who invented uh, hot air balloons uh, in, se in 1780s, uh, the moon people that you see up in the drawing are looking down on the earth uh, through telescopes uh, and they're seeing the balloon flying up. Now, this was from this drawing is from the uh, Popular Astronomy uh, by Camille Flammarion, uh, who lived from 1842 to 1925. This was one of his popular books. And I've translated the French down below. It says, but fright is in the moon, where the onlookers and the ignorant judge the wandering balloon on the little common planet. I like the way they, he says that, the little common planet. So the moon people are very frightened that earthlings are going to travel up to the moon. Of course, we really couldn't go in a hot air balloon because there's no air between the earth and the moon. But they, again, they didn't realize that at the time. Okay, next slide. Okay, as it's coming in view. Okay, Baron Munchausen. Uh, he had all kinds of crazy adventures in his books. Um, the book was actually written in 1865, uh, Baron Munchausen's narrative of his travels. Well, he goes to the moon twice. One time he goes up by a ship, uh, you know, the sails out. And if you notice, the moon has this very worried look. Actually, it's one of the clouds gives his mouth the downturn, but you see his eyes and his nose, you know, the, the man in the moon. Well, in the other one, he goes to throw a silver hatchet at a friend and he misses and it sticks in the moon. Remember the moon they thought was very close. So he throws up a hook and it hooks in the moon and he goes up the, the rope to get his hatchet back. Well, how does he get back down to earth? He cuts the rope and falls. Uh, again, some crazy ideas. And they thought, you know, he could breathe uh, this ether. So you'll find a lot of funny stories that he tells uh, in his books. Okay, next. Okay, probably the most famous trip to the moon is by Jules Verne, uh, who lived from 1828 to 1905. His book, De la Terre a la Lune, was published in 1865. And we know it as From the Earth to the Moon. He then published a sequel, which is called Round the Moon. This particular drawing is from uh, 1895, uh, two volumes that were in one in American edition. And it looks like a train. Well, he doesn't talk about it as being a whole bunch of cars. It's just like a, a bullet fired by a giant cannon on the shores of Florida, somewhere in the vicinity of what now is the uh, Cape Canaveral. Well, Vern also realized that uh, you need you would have to fire his cannon over the water so in case something went wrong, it wouldn't land on people. Well, a lot of people think that Jules Verne made up everything. No, he was a, a student of the science of his day. Now, in the book, Around the Moon, his main character is a, is a man named Barbicane. And as they're flying over the crater Tycho with its magnificent ray system, he explains that what they're looking at are cracks in the lunar surface and that he learned that from a man named James uh, Naismith, who had written 
an article back in 1844 in the memoirs of the Royal Astronomical Society of London, in which he described it. Well, Verne was obviously versed in that uh, article that Naismith had written almost 20 years later, or, I mean, earlier. So they don't reach the moon, even though I've got the shirt with the bullet crashing into the moon. That actually comes from the next slide, please. Next, next slide. Okay, can you hear it? I think my headset went off. Uh, okay, the headset went off. Can you hear me now? Next, next slide, please. Sorry for that. Well, hang up. You get the next slide. Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Uh, I have actually switched to the next slide. It takes a couple of minutes to propagate through, so just give it a give it a sec. Yeah, uh, the technical hang up. Yeah, can you see it now? I, I will uh, nope. switch it back. Okay, how about sorry? Give me one second. How about now? Yep. Okay, you got okay, it. Okay, great. Yep. Okay, this is the cover for what basically would be the second sequel to Verne's book, but it's not written by Verne, and he was not happy that it came out. Uh, this is the cover art for Un Monde Incognu des An sur la Lune, written in 1896, and it's called The Unknown Moon, Two Years on the Moon, by the uh, pen name of Pepe de Selenese. And again, you see the word Selenese in there, the moon goddess. Uh, which was a pseudonym for a man named A. Bartolo de la Drabble, and I couldn't find much about him. But what it does is his characters purchase the cannon and capsule or bullet uh, shell from Verne's people in Florida, because it's not being used, and they fire up to the moon. Now, you know where Apollo 15 landed it was near the rill called Hadley's Rill. Well, these unfortunate guys, they land in the rill and go down, 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 and they finally stop where the uh, lunar people live. And they stay with the lunar people for two years exploring. Well, this predates uh, you know, telecommunication by radio and such. And so what one of the things they did is they go up to the surface and on Mare um, Imbrium, they set up a bunch of big lights and they flash Morse code back to Earth. And the uh, people on Earth who were part of this uh, team have set up lights near uh, Pikes Peak in Colorado. And they signal back and forth while the Mare Imbrium is in the dark and at night on the Earth. And so uh, that was kind of ingenious uh, to do that. But one of the funny things in the story is they walk around to the far side of the moon and they come across a city that has a Gothic church. Uh, and then they walk around back to their base back on the front side. Now, at this time in the 1800s was still the theory that lunar craters were actually volcanoes. So how do they get home? Well, they move their capsule into the vent for a volcano that just happens to be ready to erupt it erupts and sends them back to Earth, and that's how they get back. So it's uh, like I said, this would would kind of be the second se sequel to Verne's book, but he didn't write it, and like I said, he was not happy about that. Okay, next slide, please. 
Okay, here's the famous picture of the capsule in the eye of the moon. Uh, this is from uh, Le, Le Voyage dans la Lune, A Trip to the Moon, uh, by Georges Melies, who lived from 1861 to 1938. Now, this was the first movie with a plot. And we do show this every once in a while at our Niles SNA Silent Film Museum. We show films every Saturday night, except we're going to be closed for a while, one, because of the coronavirus. But we now own the building, and we are doing major restoration. Uh, and we're going to return the theater to its glory of 19, the early 1900s. It was built in 1913. And we do know that Charlie Chaplin was there uh, for two and a half months in 1915 and made his movie like The Tramp, because we have a photograph of Charlie and his leading lady, Edna Proviance, standing in front of the little house next door to our theater, and that little house is still there. So if you're ever in the Bay Area on Saturday night, uh, come by and, and see us. We're uh, low price. We're $7. We show two shorts uh, and then a feature film, and we have live piano accompany the picture. Okay, so uh, next slide. Okay. Well, this is another trip, although it says a trip to Polaris for 264 trillion miles in an aeroplane. Uh, they stop at the moon. Now he's taking his students with him in an airplane, uh, uh, yeah, biplane, because uh, this is from the 1920s, uh, 1924. Now, Chaz S. Muir, I have no idea who he was, I can't find anything about him. Uh, I just happened to come across his book. Again, they're flying through space without any uh, air, you know, they're not in a capsule. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Now, this is a real crazy idea. That's all I can say. It's called the cellular cosmology, cosmogony. The earth is a concave sphere. Now, these people led by a man named Cyrus Korish Reed Tweed, who lived from 1839 to 1908, thought that the we lived on the inside of the Earth, and you see the map, you see South America, North America, and Africa. Well, the moon was in the middle, that smaller circle, and the reflection is there's a sun, and the stars are just a reflection off the moon. Now you can see their site in Estero, Florida. Uh, and you can go to their site. They even built a contraption where they took it out to the beach, the ocean there, and tried to show that, yes, the Earth curves upwards and not downwards. So, like I said, it's kind of a crazy, but the, the moon was only like 400 miles away from the Earth. So, again, we're back to the old uh, mythology that you could reach out and touch the moon and... Uh, there are lots of plays, Greek plays, in which that is kind of thing is mentioned. So next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. Well, this is not a trip to the moon. This is if you're going to the moon. This was a, um, the marvels of the moon, uh, or day in the moon, by Abby Theophile Moreau, who lived from 1867 to 1946. And this was a travel log. Now, the, the drawing is kind of a little strange because the Alps are not pointed. But what they thought they could see, that you'd see the shadows of the mountains on the moon, and they're all cone shaped. Well, you take a ball and light it from one side, you get a cone shaped shadow. It's like the Earth shadow is cone shaped when it is on the moon's face. Actually, tonight there's supposed to be a. Uh, lunar eclipse. I'm not sure if it's visible here in the Bay Area. But this is what they, uh, they thought. And he talks about what you would see each day uh, that you're on the moon. Okay, So we are the traveling people in this fantasy flight. Uh, I don't think the Apollo 11 crew members took this book with them. Okay. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay, as, we're as it's coming out, 
These are porcelain dolls. They're eight little maidens. It was part of a 12-slide uh, set that you would use in a view slide. And the eight little maidens are flying to the moon. Uh, and these are just the last two of the 12 slides. Uh, and it's called a series for the little folks. Uh, these are porcelain dolls with feather-like wings. Uh, and you'll notice in the right-hand slide, the number 12, uh, there's actually a prospector uh, between the, the dolls. And he's down on the surface. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to read uh, from them because it's kind of a cute little poems. <clears throat> from the earth to the moon is a very long flight, and doubtless twill take them most of the night. It's so very dark they can scarcely see to fly, and they're almost dizzy, they're up so high. But on they, they must go, there's no time to be lost. It'll, it might turn cold and there'd be so frost or the winged might change from its usual precision, or they might meet a star and they'd be a collision. That's the, the wording for slide 11, which is the upper left side. Now for number 12. Now their long flight is over, their journey is ended, and indeed they've come farther than they really intended. But now that they've, they're here, they'll just look around, for the man in the moon, if he's here, to be found. And behold, there he comes for all he is worth. He is taking a walk by the light of the earth. He welcomes them in to his house up so high. And now little maidens will bid you goodbye. So that's a little series of slides. These are published in 1895. That's the copyright mark on them uh, by the French stereo publishers of Lawrence, Kansas. So uh, here's little dolls are making a fantasy flight. Next uh, slide, please. Okay, well, all this fantasy flight stuff, uh, I don't talk about those in the, basically in the uh, last century because there were just so many uh, from H.G. Wells and uh, Isaac Asimov, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, remember in 2001, they're uh, on the moon and such. But all that fantasy stuff became reality in July of 1969 when Apollo 11 landed. Now this stamp, this is a, a block of six, the first man on the moon, and it was signed by Neil Armstrong, The middle, basically the middle stamp on the left side. Uh, now, years ago, I was selling real estate in San Leandro. And somebody had this big painting on the wall of this exact stamp, except by his foot was a crushed Oli can, Oli beer can. Uh, so that was kind of cute. But the thing is that they had painted the, a drawing based on this uh, flight. Okay. Uh, yeah, Neil Armstrong signed this back in 76. Okay. Next slide, please. So I'm just uh, going to go off track a little bit from the fantasy flights to some interesting things that I do cover in the book uh, that I like about the moon. Now here's blue moon stockings from the 1920s. Longer wear in every pair. So you've got this uh, fairy with her fairy wigs and she's sitting on the crescent moon uh, with her blue moon silk stockings. Next. Okay. Uh, in 2012, we traveled to uh, Florence, there's the Galileo Museum. I encourage everybody to go. It's not just Galileo, but it includes uh, chemistry sets, uh, all kinds of stuff from the Renaissance from Italy. It used to be their science museum, but in 2010, they reopened it as the Galileo Museum. So this is the bust of Galileo. There's his original telescopes, some of his writing, and a bunch of other stuff there. One of the things that's interesting is you're wondering what is that stuff in the right hand picture, the tall picture? Well, when Galileo passed away in 1642, he was still persona non grata to the Catholic Church. So they buried him in a back room at the Santa Croce Basilica. And in 1734, 1735, 
they went to move his body out to the main basilica and place it in a monument that they built. Well, somebody stole some bones. And in this case, they stole the right middle finger and the two bones of his palm. And they have it standing up. And so it is euphemously called Galileo's last message to the Pope. So, so they also uh, took a tooth and there's a, a vertebra and some other bones that have all been uh, now uh, put back together, so to speak, inside the Galileo Museum, although his body is uh, it's a little less than a mile away at uh, San, the Basilica of Santa Croce, which is open to the public. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Now, Galileo, as we're well aware, was the first uh, person to publish a book on his observations of the moon. A um, man named uh, uh, Harriet had observed the moon earlier in England, Thomas Harriet, but he did not publish. His drawings of the moon were not published until 1965. But these six drawings uh, Galileo published in his book, Sidereus Nuncius, and so uh, he gets priority as far as the first one to write and publish something about uh, the moon other than guesses scientifically. Okay, publish next one. Now, you know that uh, he got in trouble with the church, and this is the book, uh, The Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems. Uh, this was translated by Stillman Drake at the University of California in Berkeley, and the foreword is by Albert Einstein. Uh, Galileo survived the Inquisition by just having a house arrest for the last 10 years of his life. He did go blind looking at sunspots and such, but he spent from 1632 till his death in 1642. So uh, next slide, please. This is his uh, monument in the side wall, inside the Basilica and across directly across from him is the monument for Michelangelo. Now, one of the interesting stories is Michelangelo actually died in Rome. And before he was buried, a bunch of uh, Flor people from uh, Florence went up to Rome and stole his body and buried him in Santa Croce. Now, the interesting thing about this monument is obviously somebody else was gonna be buried in this spot because look at the fresco on the walls. There's an outline around the monument where they didn't finish painting around Galileo's monument. Now it's hard to see, but he's holding a globe and a telescope, but he's in that brownish looking uh, marble. And it talks about his life down below in the fine print. So again, it's open to the public and I do uh, suggest that people go. Uh, also Dante is buried there, Michel um, Machiavelli, all the famous Renaissance people are buried in Santa Croce. So next uh, slide. Okay, I talked earlier about uh, mapping of the moon a little bit of Endymion. This is the map that leads us to today's lunar nomenclature. It was uh, published by Giovanni Riccio, uh, Battista Riccioli. Uh, in his book, his nomenclature, he placed it on a moon map by his friend, Francisco Maria Grimaldi uh, uh, and was published in 1651. Most of the names that Riccioli placed on the moon are still in the location where he named them. And some of them were Langranis's names, but he moved them. Uh, he placed uh, scientists together and Arab uh, scholars together and other scientists and friends and whatnot. Uh, so this is the first map and it shows the what we call the libration zones, in other words, the area of the moon that you see only sometimes, you don't see it all the time, as the moon in its orbit gets ahead of us or is behind us. So we can actually see approximately 59% of the moon's surface and not just an even 50% if we were just looking straight on it all the time. So next slide, please. Okay, now if you want to look at the modern slides, uh, the maps, uh, what we call the LAC maps. Uh, you can go to the USGS Flagstaff office uh, under their website 
of HTTPS planetary names, wrusgs.gov, or just uh, Google USGS Flagstaff. And all of these, there's 144 of the electronic maps based on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, LRO. And they are digitized and you can expand them and contract them and uh, see, you can even see the uh, uh, where the Apollo spacecraft landed and such. You could also, uh, I recommend if you don't have it now, is Google Earth. There's a menu you can pull down and it has Google Moon and it has Google Mars. And again, these are spacecraft imagery, which is really fun to uh, take a good close look at. Okay, next. Okay, I'm gonna talk about a few things on the moon. I think my microphone just went off again. Uh, come on. Okay, we're back on again. It, it seems to cut out for me. Okay, so this is the, the full moon and, and you guys take a look at it for a moment. Uh, one of the things, uh, the fantasy is the rabbit in the moon. Do you see the rabbit? Give you a moment to take a good look because he plays quite a role in lunar mythology all around the world. Okay. I see you're looking, studying it very carefully there. Let's go, <laughs> let's go on to the next slide. Next slide, please. Can you hear me? Am I still on, am I on again or not? Okay. And there you can see the outline of where the, the ears and the eye is the uh, crater Kepler. And his little bunny tail is Mari Chrysium. The other, Mar, the, the ears is Mari Imbrium, which I mentioned earlier when they were sending light signals, Morse code from uh, the book of the, the adventurers on the moon. Okay, next slide, please. Now, one of the things I mentioned about the rabbit in the moon in the culture, these are uh, pottery from the Membres Indians who are in the American Southwest and they are stylized rabbits. Now you look down at the left plate, by the hind leg, you'll see a circle with uh, little rays around it. Well, yeah, right there. Thank you. Now, this plate is believed to depict the supernova explosion of July 1054. Now, this pottery was discovered in the 1930s in a abandoned village that other pottery and such dates it from that the Indians lived for, in this village from eight from 1050 to about 1100 AD. Now, Professor Robert Robbins of the University of Texas, his, he and his students counted all the various lines of dozens and dozens of pottery. This was the only object with 23 rays on it, or 23 of anything. Now, based on the Asian records, the supernova was visible in the night sky, in the day sky for 23 days. So we, and we know from uh, calculations of the Crab Nebula to where it was in, on July in 1054, there was a uh, moon nearby. So we know that the rabbit symbolizes the moon and this object symbolizes more than likely the uh, supernova explosion. Now in the right plane picture, you see there's an eagle eating the rabbit and the ribs are showing. And what they believe this indicates is the phases of the moon that the eagle is eating the moon each month. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, well, I'll talk as it's clearing up. Uh, in uh, September of, uh, 19, of 2019, my wife and I were part of a group that went to China before the virus thing. Uh, and in the International Continental Intercontinental Hotel in Lhasa, Tibet, we stayed in uh, Tibet for 
a week. Uh, they were having their mid-autumn festival, which bases um, the uh, rabbit in the moon as one of their objects. This is a blow-up balloon of the moon, and it is with south up, and they have a white rabbit with also blow-up uh, sitting next to it. Now, in the Chinese mythology, there is a rabbit in the moon, and he pounds a drum. And when you go to get married, you have to get the rabbit's permission. And then when you are married in the ceremony, you have your hands tied together with a red ribbon, but your marriage had to be approved by the rabbit in the moon. So this is a, in the uh, lobby of the hotel, which is just a beautiful hotel. And then the, you see an, uh, a little bit of the roof. It's an arch glass roof. And at night they have little lights twinkling. The lobby lights are basically off and it's like the stars there. And the stars are incredible uh, when there are no clouds. Uh, we did get a couple nights with no clouds up at Lasha. Uh, you're way up above the most of the Earth's atmosphere, the moisture and such. So you do get a beautiful uh, view of the night sky. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, William Henry Pickering uh, in his 1903 moon book published these uh, drawings that people made of the moon. And the top left picture is the man in the moon, the face. Number two is the crab. Number three is the woman reading her book, which I point out. Number four in the middle on the right side is a donkey. Uh, number five is a lady in the moon. And the same feature is also known as the man, uh, he, the one of the lovers. So these were astronomical drawings that Pickering shows uh, out of what you, what you can see. So next slide, please. Okay, let's see what's going on. Okay, so there you see the lady reading the book. Uh, she has Mari Christium as a pillow and you see her bodice and such. Uh, these are uh, just things that you, you think you see as real being a real person, but uh, you know they're they're not real. They're just what you imagine as, as seeing. Uh, the large raid crater is Copernicus in the amongst the dark area there, and up near the top is the, yeah right near the top is the is uh, Tycho and the rays uh, that I mentioned earlier with uh, Professor Barbicane in the uh, trip around the moon, they're flying over that feature. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now from a postcard, uh, here's the five nights before full moon each month is when you can see the lady of the moon. Uh, and this feature also sometimes is, appears to be a man. As you look in the lower right hand uh, images, there is the uh, dark outline of the moon, the man with his uh, curly hair and his mustache and his nose. And sometimes it's also uh, that he, the woman is kissing his uh, right cheek. This is from a book, a uh, German book uh, from 1907. And up above, it's kind of a little hard to see, but there's a donkey in the moon. This is from a 1906 postcard. And the question, it, it says, is this a nightmare, M-A-R-E? So, <laughs> so let's go on to the next one. Okay, I'm going to show a little romance of the moon. Now, you notice that the moon is heart-shaped, and the white on the water is a glitter path. That's its terminology. This is from Harper's Weekly in November 1907. And the lovers are on uh, the shore uh, looking out towards the moon. So next one. And, and those are in my book. These are also in the book. Uh, these are a series of postcards that I own. Uh, this was a, the left one is a French postcard from the 1930s. Uh, when you see the, there's a crescent moon up in the, up in the corner. The right one is a German postcard circa 1910. And you see there's a smiling full moon 
peeking out through the clouds as they're moving along in their automobile. Next. Okay, the left is a French postcard from circa 1930 with the full moon and the clouds behind them. Uh, the right one is from Austria, uh, circa 1900, uh, with the lovers are in a park. Okay, next one. And this is the last one that uh, after we're done, don't forget to brush your teeth tonight, zone-wise, before you go to bed. This is a Johnson & Johnson advertisement from 1887. So again, that's my last slide. I do hope that uh, you've all enjoyed the presentation. Uh, again, Luna Cognita is now published. Um, and so uh, it's not technical. I tried to avoid that. So it's a good read, lots of uh, topics about observing the moon. I talk about each feature uh, that's named uh, some official, a few of the unofficial names, uh, the people and biography of the people, what they did uh, and such. So uh, enjoy and it's been my pleasure to uh, present this presentation, even though we had some technical glitches along the way. Uh, I, I hope that you still uh, enjoyed what we've done. So thank you very much. And I guess uh, our hosts, have you guys gotten any questions yet? Has anybody posted? We, we can't hear you, Sakata. Yeah. Yeah. Have you got any questions yet? Uh, your audio appears to be off. Anything yet? Yeah, we can How hear about you. that? Can you? Yes. Yeah, can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I have been having some trouble with my AirPods and headphones switching today. Um. So thank you for the talk, Bob. That was wonderful. Um, so much historical information that we never knew before. So, um, YouTube channel has a few comments and uh, discussion going on here, uh, but. As far as questions go, uh, I have one question that Rachel posted. So she wants to know um, who paints the best picture of flight to the moon for you in, in the literature that you have come across? Who, who paints the best picture? Yeah, of flight to the moon. Well, I, I do have one by uh, Bonestell uh, that was, uh, it's not listed in his catalog, but it shows the Apollo capsule flying over the moon. Uh, something got a little wrong because he still got the third stage attached to uh, the space capsule. Um, that, that was, I was trying to buy it on eBay maybe 15 years ago or so. And uh, the people who owned it pulled the uh, auction after I'd already bid on it, but they did give me permission to publish it in the book. Uh, there are lots of drawings uh, of the books, uh, you know, within the books and the covers or within the book itself, or there's no art. Uh, so I really don't have a favorite per se uh, of uh, any fantasy flight. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I do cover in one chapter uh, drawings of the moon, how to draw the moon. Uh, and I talk about some of the art history, uh, the earliest natural drawings of the moon are from the uh, 13, 1400s, uh, mainly crucifixion scenes in which people interpret the darkness uh, during the crucifixion of being a solar eclipse along with a lunar eclipse. 
which physically you, we can't do. But of course, uh, people think, well, you know, the crucifixion, anything is possible. It was God who did it. But, you know, you can only have a solar eclipse when it is new moon uh, because the, the moon has to move in front of the sun. And new moon is when the unlit side of the moon is facing us. And a full moon, you can only have at the time when it is a uh, full moon because the earth's shadow gets, you know, we get between the moon and the sun and our sh cone-shaped shadow then is cast on the moon. Uh, but the moon always has to be at one of its nodes. It, it moves in an orbit that is inclined to the earth's orbit by about five degrees. And so that five degrees is enough that our shadow misses the moon or the moon travels above the sun or, or below the sun for a, during a time we wouldn't otherwise have an eclipse. If the moon moved around the earth the same plane as we move around the sun, we would have an eclipse every month. We would have a lunar eclipse every full moon and a solar eclipse every new moon, but it just doesn't work out that way. Uh, so here you have, uh, I have some paintings and one is a tapestry uh, showing uh, the two eclipses at the same time as the eclipse. Now in the late, early 1500, we believe Leonardo da Vinci sketched the moon, uh, naked eye, obviously, uh, in his notebooks. But this, uh, his drawings were not published until the late 1800s. Uh, so nobody really knew about it. It was all kind of hidden away. Uh, the Queen of England has one of his notebooks, and that's not open to the public. Uh, the others are put away, but this was a uh, finally published very rare, very expensive uh, books. And I've been allowed by the University of UCLA uh, to republish a copy of the copy that they have. And that's in the book. Um, but also Leonardo came up with the idea that the ashen moon, you know, when you can see uh, shortly after new moon, when you can see uh, the moon lit by the Earth's shadow, what we call the ashen light. Uh, he's given uh, credit for coming up with the scientific reason, being that it was the light from the sun reflecting off the Earth, reflecting then back off the moon. But like I say, his ideas were not published until a little over you know, 1890s or so. And there's another man who published with now a rare book in which he did discuss it uh, back in uh, 16, uh, about 1685, I believe the book. I'd have to look it up right now, it's off the top of my head. But uh, Leonardo probably made the first uh, scientific drawing of the moon. And since then now, you know, electronics, like I said, you can go to Google Earth or go to a look at the LAC maps at the USGS office. Down, you can download them and expand them uh, on your computer. Uh, those features of the moon that I really couldn't get a good uh, photograph of because it's on the limb, the edges of the moon, I use those LAC maps uh, from the LRO images uh, so I could show the images. Uh, so uh, again, I, I hate to be flagging my book constantly, but. <laughs> But it is uh, selling quite well, and I'm getting good reviews. And the thing is, you know, I, I started writing this book in 1989, and Harrison Schmidt, who I met at a solar eclipse in 1991, wrote the introduction, and he worked on the moon in Apollo 17. Uh, so it's kind of ironic in that the book was published at the time when we're all uh, shut in, and uh, we got all this uh, pandemic stuff and whatnot going on uh, after it you know, could have been published years ago, but I wanted to make it as complete as possible. So anyway, any other questions or was that? So I have a question. Sure. Um, just, I, I'm just wondering what has been your inspiration to study the moon 
um, and write this book? Well, I, I actually got started as a child when my father uh, showed me the night sky. He was uh, inclined to that kind of stuff. He actually went up as a high schooler. He went up to Tacoma, Washington with a bunch of his buddies to observe the uh, solar eclipse there while he was still in high school. Uh, I received my uh, astronomy merit badge in 1963 when I was 16. And I just always had an interest uh, in the sky. I remember lying in bed looking out the window I, when I could see the moon and using binoculars. Didn't know that you shouldn't be looking through a glass window, you know, the heat of the room looking. Uh, but I've also written a book called Star Hopping, Your v Visa to Viewing the Universe, which was for observing uh, the dark, the uh, deep sky objects. But uh, in front of my house, I could look at the moon through my telescope and not worry about the street lights, but uh, you couldn't really do that for looking at deep sky objects. I always had an, an interest in who uh, who objects were named for. I think I lost my microphone again. No, you're um, fine. We can hear you. You can still hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, I was always wondering what features were named for, who, what was, the one I point out is the crater Alphonsus. And I couldn't find any books on that. And we didn't have the internet in those days. And so what I finally found out that it was King Alfonso the Wise uh, who uh, Richie only named it for. And so I started to write a book just on the nomenclature, the moon, and one thing led to another. And I kept writing and kept writing and kept writing. And uh, when I got hooked up with Springer, uh, I was talking to one of the secretaries there who I had been in touch with before. And she said, well, what are you writing now? And I said, well, I'm writing a big book on the moon. And she got all excited and said, we're looking for a big book on the moon. And so I sent him a proposal and within a week or so I had a contract to write this book. And I said, well, you know, how, long, how big a book? And they said, just keep writing till you're done. And so at that, when I signed the contract, the book was 1,100 pages, and now it's 1,800. Uh, so I've tried to include as much as I could that, that's interesting and, and rare stuff that's not in other moon books, as well as a lot of stuff that is in the moon books, obviously, uh, and presented it in such a way that uh, I tell you, talk to you about uh, optical equipment and photography. A lot of the people involved in the development of photography since 1839 have names on the moon. People who invented uh, telescopes and improvements and eyepieces and such all have names on the moon. So I tied all that together. And a lot of uh, chapters and such deal with old theories. As example, the rays, which I've mentioned about um, in the trip around the moon. Uh, People had theories that, that the, the rays were like cracked and as the sun went over the crack, vapors came out and we were looking at vapors. Others thought that there had been a uh, lunar ocean and that these were salt streaks like in India that Mahatma Gandhi took uh, people to as a protest over the price of salt, that these streaks are basically salt like there. And it wasn't until, uh, Eugene Shoemaker, the, who became famous with the comet that crashed into Jupiter, uh, determined that it was probably pulverized uh, material from when an object would smash into the moon, uh, the impact crater uh, theory. And when Apollo, Apollo 11 landed, they landed in an area that had this material that was intended why they went to that spot. And they brought that back and said, yep, it's powdered rocks and it's white because it hasn't been exposed to the solar rays long enough to to basically disappear turn gray like the rest of the surface so i talk about those kind of things and i also got the chance to interview buzz aldrin and talk to him about um i i, I told him i i understand that you guys got to eat uh, green cheese while you were on the moon <laughs> i was joking with him and he said, yeah, and it tasted better than the, than the food NASA gave us. You know, he had a little twinkle in his eye. But um, 
so yeah, I met with him. I also had dinner one night with uh, Eugene Cernan from also Apollo uh, 17 Moonwalker on board the USS Hornet, which is a museum, floating museum in Alameda. Uh, and it's docked at the same pier that its predecessor, TV-8, left on the, uh, the mission to bomb Tokyo, the famous 30 seconds over Tokyo. So this Hornet, the CV-12, picked up uh, Apollo 11 and Apollo 12 crews, and the Apollo 12 pickup was its last official mission. Now, in the hangar deck, they have the quarantine trailer. It was not the one used for Apollo 11 and 12. It was actually intended for Apollo 14 and then not used. And what they had originally was the helicopters parked there and footprints painted on the floor. And the sign originally said Neil Armstrong's footprints. Well, when we had a celebration of the Hornet picking the crew up, this was in uh, 1999 on July 24th, Aldrin was the only one who was able of the three crew members to attend. And they cha quickly changed the sign to say Aldrin's footprints. <laughs> so where the sign had said Armstrong. So that's where I got to meet uh, Buzz. And uh, I've been in communication with him every once in a while. That's but uh, those are some of the things. And I talk about those kind of things in the book. You're not going to find that in other uh, books on the moon. Uh, but yeah, he was a, he, he has a little streak of humor there. We, I enjoyed that. And uh, so there's lots of other things that I do talk about. One of the major things in the early chapter is all of the lore from around the world. Everybody has stories about the moon and in some of them it's a coyote who causes trouble and in others it's a rabbit uh just all kinds of stuff like that that i also cover so it's not just uh you know get out your telescope and look at the moon tonight there's just a lot of stuff in the three volumes and make sure that when you get it if you're buying the book from amazon they have screwed up and sent a single volume to some people instead of all three which it's packaged as all three and the price is for all three volumes. So, uh, and I don't know if you can see it, but there is happen to be a copy of the book sitting right behind here. Uh, so I, again, thank you for asking me to give the talk. And, no and I'm not have... worried about the delay. Everybody's no, on. No, that's fine. I think, no, no, we are fine. Uh, I have one more question for you though. Sure, so okay. Mar Marianne is asking, interesting how initially Arthians weren't afraid of inhabitants of the other heavenly bodies. What was the first horror of others where we were afraid? From other planets? Um, uh, I'm not sure, honestly, I'm just reading well, the question out here for the first time. Okay. Um, so maybe she can well, elaborate. Well, uh, in the early, early 1900 publishes War of the Worlds, in which the Martians come down to Earth and we have a war. And of course, it made it became famous in the Orson Welles Mercury Theater broadcast in, I think, 38 or 39, in which supposedly people got scared about it. They didn't realize that it was a, a radio play. Um, and of course, it, it turns out that the earthly bacteria is what kills the Martians. Um, it is interesting in almost every movie where aliens come, we immediately try to kill them. Uh, even though we've had, uh, maybe because of stories like um, uh, To Serve Man, where it turns out that the book that they bring is a cookbook uh, to you know, cook people. Um, we, never, we never seem to have peaceful aliens land. <laughs> and so where do they come from? Uh, did they, uh, you know, there's, there's these shows, uh, you know, about ancient aliens um, coming from the stars, visiting during our our ancient times. Uh, who knows? There was one show on a discovery where they they claimed that the moon was actually a spaceship because it was hollow inside. When they had the seismometers that they planted in Apollo eleven, and the uh, spacecraft, the uh, fourth stage, third stage, I mean. No, yeah, four stage crashed into the moon. The seismographs picked up a ringing like uh, uh, sound. It just kept going and going and going, and finally died out. And so, so they said, oh, the moon's hollow. Well, these ancient 
alien theorists that, oh, see, the moon is just the actual spaceship and the aliens are watching it. I said, oh, you got to be kidding. Um, so uh, to answer your question, it's hard to say where they came from other than uh, more than likely it goes back to H.G. Wells' uh, book. That's kind of, kind of like the first book that I'm aware of or the earliest book dealing with aliens coming to Earth uh, to do us harm. But, so it's, it's funny you mentioned that because uh, I, I started thinking about all the movies I have watched and you're right, there is a common theme that we're always scared of aliens and trying to kill them and send them back. But there is actually um, one Bollywood movie <laughs> that, in which um, the alien is very peaceful. It's called PK, I think. Uh, it's a very funny movie. Uh, it's kind of worth a watch. And also, I think E.T. was one of the movies where we did not actually kill the alien, right? So Which, which movie? E.T. E.T., e. oh, e. e. right, right. Yeah, yeah. So we're not all that bad. Well, because he was a cute, cuddly uh, type of uh, creature. Um, but then you have The Day the Earth Stopped uh, yeah. you know, back in the 1950s, uh, where the alien tries to uh, get us to live in peace instead of war. And, of right. course, the military tries to blow him up, you know, and uh, again... He's just come in peace and and such. And to make his uh, point is when he stops everything that's uh, electrical. Uh, that's where the theme comes, you know, the, the day the earth stood still uh, with Patricia Neal. I forget who plays the, uh, the alien. But, uh, yeah, that's kind of, a, like you said, it's a common theme of, of Hollywood is uh, we have to save the world from these nasty aliens. We don't try to find out if they're good. And E.T., like I said, it was just a cuddly... A uh, lovable character, yeah. Uh, yeah. And the kids, you know, yeah. how how can you have you know fail when you have? Kids? Yeah, I know, I know, so, I know, right? Yeah. Oh well, uh, I think love I don't see. Pieces. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see any more questions coming in. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, there is just a couple of comments. Uh, one from Delti saying, I have some information for Bob. Chas S. Muir. In the Edward, Edwardian era, Chas was a common abbreviation for Charles. Right, His name was that. Charles Stoddard Muir, uh, 1873 to 1962. There is a bit more of that on the internet. And... I think this is Swami who's saying the sign on USS Hornet now says Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin's footsteps. So I think they corrected that. <laughs> no, I haven't, I haven't been on the ship before. Okay, what was it, Charles? What was his middle name? Uh, his middle name is uh, Stoddard. S-T-O-D-D-A-R-D. And the years? 1873 birth. 1873. And 1962 death. 1962. Huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'll take a look at it because I, I was searching for that kind of throughout the book. I tried to make sure I gave people the, you know their full moon, full name. I mean, and uh, their life dates. Right. And and I did have one gentleman um, who was an editor at Astronomy Magazine, and I asked him for his middle name. And he he wouldn't tell me till we were on a uh, conf on a uh, at a conference, and he walked up to me and he says, "Bob, because my middle name is." And he gave, gave me my middle gave me his middle name. I wasn't going to ask him. I'd asked him before. He said no. Now that he saw me uh, uh, and met me, then he was willing to give me his full name. So I tried that because what used to bug me all the time was in scientific lot writing. It's usually the person's initials and then their last name. And so um, in, in many cases, there might be uh, people with similar names. Uh, you look up and you'll find the same, you know, full name. You say, okay, is this the person that I'm looking for? So, so I tried to do that and to give their life dates. Uh, just more information as, as I could find. Uh, like I say, it, I spent off and on uh, about 30 years. There was time when I was an elected official and uh, working full-time job as a uh, 
technical writer uh, since 1980, but I've basically been retired uh, since 2002 when I got laid off on a Friday, November 22nd, which was the second time I'd gotten laid off on a Friday, November 22nd uh, from a previous job. So I was over 50 and everybody was looking for 20 somethings. And so I just said, you know, my wife agreed, Bob, just write your book. <laughs> and so that's what I did for, you know, I've been doing for almost, uh, well, for the last 18 years. And now I've got to work on that honeydew list. That yeah. It's almost a chapter book now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great way to spend, spend your retirement for sure. Yeah, so, no, it's been enjoyable. Yeah. It's been very, yeah. very rewarding, especially yeah. getting that, that book in my hands uh, as published in hardback for the first time. So again, thank you. And I guess if that's... Oh, no worries. Our pleasure. Thank you for uh, giving the talk and um, adapting to the virtual format. I mean, we, we planned on doing this in person in March. And uh, yeah. our president, Jerry, actually insisted that I reschedule you as soon as possible. And it's yeah. unfortunate that he recently passed away and couldn't be here today. Uh, but I'm, I'm really glad we, we could make this happen. Thank yeah. you. One, one other thing... Um, I gave a talk on lunar domes back for SJA. Oh, okay. it had to be back in the uh, early, uh, late 80s, maybe early 90s. And David North, who was a member, he came up to me and said, Bob, how are you going to talk for an hour on lunar domes? I said, just watch, David. And <laughs> an hour later, I was finishing up, and the questions were another hour. This was over, you know, at Hoagie Park one night. And I, I just looked at David and I said, well, I held my watch up and I said, well, you know, it's two hours, David. And he said, I don't know how you did it, Bob. <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of information that I can, that I can cover. And uh, that was one of the things. So this is the one that I really like doing out of the book. It's fascinating and, and such. If I had more pictures of off a of book cover, you know, they just not, a lot of them don't have, uh, uh, images. So trying to do a PowerPoint, I filled it out with the other stuff. Uh, again, at the end of each chapter, I do have things like the postcards and other photographs and things that you won't find in other uh, lunar books. Got so, okay. all righty. So Thank I you very much. Oh. Once again, uh, I don't see any more questions coming in. So I think we can call it an end. All righty. Thank yep. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Glenn.